Good evening, all, and welcome. Did you see that? Oh, I thought there was someone behind you. My mistake. It must have just been a shadow. No, wait, there's someone there. You should definitely check. Or is there? That's the kind of fear that you might experience when encountering a stalker. Be warned. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to Celestial Noor for joining us in tonight's video. So get ready, because it's time to let the darkness take control. I met a guy online. We spoke for a day or two, but I was at the tail end of my degree and things were getting to be a lot. So I decided that there would be no dating until I was done. I let the handful of guys that seemed nice know before deleting the dating app, so they would know why I deleted it and wouldn't think I ghost them. He happened to be online when I sent it and said I seemed cool and asked if we could keep in touch. Sure, no worries. I added him on Facebook. Maybe once a week he'll ask how I was. Normal conversation stuff. I'd chat about uni, work, the gym, whatever. And after about perhaps two to three months, he's like, hey, we've been chatting for a bit. Why don't we grab a coffee? I'm like, yeah, sure. He seemed nice enough. I reiterated it would be as friends and that was fine with him. I was about to head into exams, so we made plans for the three weeks time after I had finished. He started messaging me more and more regularly after making plans, more than once a day, and starts calling it a date, which people call catching up coffee date without it meaning an actual date. But I wanted to make sure that we were still on the same page, so I just said, Hey, you keep calling it a date. Just to make it clear, we're just catching up as friends. He snapped. He was sending me all sorts of horrible things on Facebook. So I blocked him. I gave him my number when we made plans though. So we started calling and calling and leaving voicemails. It was late. So I put my phone on silent and went to sleep. Next morning. I wake up to 37 missed calls and voicemails between 10 p.m. continuing until 4 a.m., as well as a multitude of horrible texts. Now this was seven years ago, when you couldn't just block someone on a phone. At first I thought that if I ignored him he would get bored, but after about a week, he wasn't slowing down, with dozens of calls a day. I called my phone company to have him blocked, and they said that you can only block three people. Are you sure? I had to jump through all the hoops, and then they turned around and said they couldn't do it, and that I would have to call the police. So I did, and they told me I'd have to call the phone company, but I could make a statement of harassment in case he did something more. Three weeks later, he's still going strong, but in his texts, he starts saying he's going to force me to go on a date with him. I won't have a choice. Then he begins saying that if I won't come to him, he will come to me, and is telling me my schedule, with where I will be at any given time, which he puts together based on our weekly conversation about normal stuff, threatening to come to me wherever I will be. This meant I had to stop doing my regular activities and pretty much became a hermit. He ended up making a threat to my life. I can't remember what he said word for word, but it was essentially, girls like you get what they deserve or something like that. But clearly more threateningly, as he said that he would be the one to make it happen. I contacted the police again and that was enough for an RVO, and I never heard from him again. Oh, and I was 20, but his pictures looked younger, so I didn't realize online, but it turned out this guy was 34. So it wasn't just a dumbass young kid, 
it was a grown-ass man. I've had many other psychos since this guy, but I'm very grateful phones have since allowed you to block anyone at any time. This happened in 2011 to 2012. My boyfriend at the time, John, and I were 19 and we had just moved in together. Both away from home for the first time, we were ecstatic. We picked up a first floor two bedroom apartment so we'd have space for a roommate in a large complex near our college, thinking it would be perfect for us. Spoiler alert, it ended up being a total dump. The first couple of months were idyllic. We felt safe enough in the area to go on nightly bike rides to get snacks. And then we started having problems. First our crappy little car was broken into. The window was smashed and the GPS, affectionately named Dottie, was stolen. We reported it to the police and informed our apartment complex. The landlord's response was a compassionate, that's not our fault. A couple of weeks later, we were laying in bed when out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow dart past the window. Our bed was on the right underneath it. I jumped up and looked out of the closed blinds, only to be greeted by a crouching silhouette of what looked like a man in a baggy clothing and a beanie. He appeared to be trying to listen for any movement, possibly trying to see through any cracks in the blinds. I was too terrified to go look out of the blinds, but John did and told me he couldn't get a good look at him. Our presence doesn't seem to deter the figure at all. We called the cops and waited. The guy finally took off after 15 minutes of just crouching at our window. An officer arrived an hour after we called and said he'd do a sweep of the area, but he had already been gone for 45 minutes by then. This guy, well, I assumed it was the same one, showed up a few times a week for months. No matter the temperature, no matter the weather. We called the cops each time, but to no avail. We actually started to get used to him looking in, and after a long period of no escalation, got complacent and began to wonder if he was just a peeping Tom or eavesdropper of some sort rather than someone casing the joint as we initially assumed it was. It was always just the same thing. He would show up and we would see his silhouette crouch outside for our window for about 15 minutes until he left. The worst part is that I could never see his face or anything. He was too well covered and it was too dark. Essentially, we were being haunted by this creepy, faceless, crouching shadow. We finally bought thick curtains for the bedroom so we couldn't see in anymore. I think half the reason why we bought the curtains was because we didn't want him to see in anymore. Out of sight, out of mind and all that. And there seemed to be no other choice but ignorance with how unhelpful the unconcerned cops have been. And indeed, with the curtains permanently drawn, we stopped thinking about him for a little bit. John's younger sister was living with us by that time. She was very much a capable woman, so we weren't too worried about leaving her alone while we went on a short vacation. She had never complained about the creeper, although she was aware of him, and he didn't seem to stop by her window. Neither her room nor the living room had the same thick curtains as a bedroom. Well, we had our vacation, and we came back. The first thing that she said to us was, so, your friend stopped by. Our eyes grew wide. Uh, the creeper? She nodded and went on to explain that she was in the living room playing video games in the dark when he walked up to the living room window with the blinds drawn, put a flashlight against the window and began knocking on it. She had screamed, ran to the bathroom, locked herself in and called 911, but it was the same story. The cops took forever to show up and by the time they did, Again, the creeper was long gone. This set off something in John. Now the creeper seemed to be escalating and the jerk was fucking with his little sister. I'm positive if she had called him when this was going on, we would have headed straight back to the apartment during our vacation, which is probably why she didn't. He told me that he was going to take care of it himself. I begged him not to, but at the same time I also understood where he was coming from. 
My fear was not knowing whether the guy had a gun or not, but I gave up arguing. So we kept the curtains open that night and waited for the creeper to show up. Around 1 a.m. he finally did. John grabbed a bat and walked calmly out of the apartment. I hid in the bedroom closet, phone already dialed to 911, terrified of what I was about to hear go down. What I did hear was John giving off a terrifying guttural scream somewhere near the back corner of the building, followed by the shadow of the guy outside the thin bedroom window standing up, stumbling, falling back, and then standing up again and running off. I heard the footsteps of John go charging past the thin bedroom window as he continued uttering that freaky scream. When John came back inside, unscathed, the mixture of relief and hilarity of his terrifying howl led us to both laugh until our stomachs hurt. It was kind of awesome to realize what a wimp that guy who had been scaring us for months turned out to be, once confronted. And that was it. We even kept the curtains open to see if he'd come back. But that was the last we ever saw the creeper. And I hoped to never officially meet him. Incidentally, our apartment was burglarized not too long after that. Along with a neighbor on the same day, but we couldn't confirm it had anything to do with this guy. It seems a bit obvious, although isn't that an awfully long time to be casing an apartment of three poor college students? But the police were entirely unconcerned, even bored by the whole thing. There were cameras in the hallway, but the complex told us, of course, they weren't working that day. We moved out a couple of months before our lease was up because we couldn't stand that place anymore. Growing up in a small town, you often have the mentality that you know most people who you live with which is very often the case. In mine, when I was 14, I thought I knew everybody. Obviously not by name, but for the most part by face. You may have seen them walking around in the supermarket, maybe even at the local fair or something like that. I never really knew much about Mark. He was always very much a peripheral character in my life. I was semi-aware of his existence, as I'm sure I was for most, but I didn't know anything about him. Which is why when he started speaking to me in school one day, I didn't just disregard him, and spoke to him very openly, and we had polite conversation. He seemed nice. He was telling me about his pet Komodo dragon that he kept at home, which I found very fascinating. We talked, and then it was time for class, so off I went. When I went to sit down and was pulling out my pens and paper, did my friend sit next to me and start grilling me on why I was speaking to him? I didn't really understand where this was coming from, until she elaborated that Mark had been creepy as hell, and that he had followed her home from the fate the year before, never speaking to her the whole time, just following her from the distance until she reached her home. This unnerved me, and in an act of solidarity, agreed to not speak to him again, as she was a very close friend. A few days passed and I hadn't seen Mark, but then I bumped into him in the hallway. We were just looking at each other, intently, for those few seconds, before I brushed past him and carried on on my way. I wasn't sure if I should say something, or nothing at all. Nothing being the better option in my opinion. But I think he understood from my body language that I didn't want to speak with him. The way I looked at my shoes as I walked away. Some time passed after that, and I didn't see him anymore. For the most part, I forgot about him, and he went back to being a peripheral character in my life. But that's when the periphery began bleeding through, and Mark started getting brave. I'd see him more often, 
If I was sitting reading a book under a tree or in the library, I might find him peeping at me through the shelves or through a bush. This to me, even whilst writing it, sounds silly, cartoonish and exaggerated. But I assure you, these were his very actions. There'd be times when I would speak to my friends at the lunch table, catching up over our classes and the local gossip, and he would be looking, just staring at us from the distance. We'd comment on it, but I knew he was really just staring at me. He never said anything, and whenever I looked, he'd always look away, pretending that he were doing something else. I didn't try and talk to him about it. I didn't think it were worth my time. We both knew what he was doing. Why bother addressing it, I thought. And besides, he was only 14, as was I. What was the worst that could happen? That was, of course, my mistake. A few weeks after, did the stalking truly turn up a notch? It was starting to get cold now. Winter was certainly coming in early this year. And as I was passing by some houses on my way home, did I look back because I felt like eyes were boring into the back of my neck. Not too far away was Mark, wearing a hooded sweatshirt, approaching me rapidly. Part of me thought that I could just wait until he caught up and tell him to back off. But the other part of me felt that something was very wrong about this, and I ran like my life depended on it all the way home. Just as I was reaching my door, did I turn around and see him panting and running, nearly reaching the door itself, which I slammed shut just in time before he arrived. I didn't want to know why he was chasing me. But when I opened the door, all panicked and panting, it alerted my father. My father instantly called the police, and having a friend in law enforcement in a small town really does make a difference. They immediately sent a car out, and Mark was found pretty quickly. When they picked him up, they searched him, as there was something very ominous about the way he was dressed. There was a knife concealed in his pants. It was huge. My parents were absolutely horrified. After that day, I and the rest of the town didn't see Mark again. I didn't want to ask my dad what happened, but I just knew that I wouldn't be seeing him and that he wouldn't be bothering me anymore. It's been some time since this occurred. Maybe I should ask for details. Nonetheless, Mark, let's never meet again. After high school, I needed a job to pay for college and the local funeral home was hiring. So I applied and I got the job. I was young and in good shape and somewhat handsome. About two years into working for the funeral home, I went to a house to do a removal. It was for the husband of a lady we will call Becky. Becky was in her late 30s or 40s. Her husband died of an OD and it was very shocking to her. Part of my job was to comfort the family and let them know that we were there for them. Well, Becky took it too far. After I left the house with her husband and went to the funeral home to prepare the body for a funeral, I was getting ready to leave to go home. Becky was outside waiting. Nothing seemed too weird. Normally families come later in the day to make arrangements for the funeral. And Becky talked to me and it seemed off how she looked at me. After a few minute conversation, I got in my car and went home. A few days later, we had the funeral. Becky hugged and thanked me for the service. That's when it got weird. She grabbed my butt, but not in a sexual way, just like her hand just went there. A few days later, I was leaving my house and Becky's car was out in my driveway. 
This happened a few times over the next few weeks. Then she showed up at my university. She somehow found my Instagram and phone number. She would text me several times a week. I thought she was just grieving and attaching herself to the first person she saw after a tragic event, but she wouldn't stop. After having her follow me to pick up my girlfriend, I decided enough was enough and I called the cops, but she was gone. A few weeks later, Becky was arrested for assaulting somebody. It's safe to say, let's not meet Becky. I grew up with four older brothers. For context, I'm a girl. They got me into League of Legends, and since I was young, I have been hooked. So, as far as social life goes, it was pretty much spent online. By the time I was 19, I was pretty good at the game, and my brothers, for the most part, had all but left and no longer played. It was just me. I was very much into my cyber world. I had built up an army of friends online, and I'm gonna be honest, being a girl playing an online game is a bit of a confidence booster. Some of these friends I'd grown really close with, even added them on Skype, Discord, WhatsApp, and we would chat all the time. And we couldn't wait until we could log back in into our virtual world to carry on doing whatever it was we needed to do. I had a job working in a bar, which meant that my hours didn't always coincide with other people for gameplay, but we still had a good time when it did. I was recently single, as my online boyfriend had dumped me for another girl. But I wasn't salty, as we'd never even met in real life. This is important later. Cue in Gareth, or Stormbreaker43. He and I were regular friends. We'd known each other for a while and we were part of the same group, but we didn't talk all that much although we did have each other on social media, as back in the day, I tended to be very liberal with who I added. He and I started talking a bit more. He'd always compliment me on my looks, telling me how gorgeous I was, and that he really wanted to meet me. He never told me where he lived, but he had heard through the grapevine and what other people knew about me that I lived in a relatively medium-sized city in the Midwest. He already knew which one. I just want to be a little bit more anonymous for the sake of the story. To cut a long story short, he started grilling all my friends to get personal information about me, but he was sneaky about it. He'd throw in these questions very carefully as some of my friends wouldn't even notice that he were asking, and the fact that he varied his sources when it came to sourcing questions meant that no one noticed early on. When he'd gathered enough information about me, did he manage to locate the bar I was working at. I was just doing my thing, it was about 10pm, and it was getting a little bit quiet, as the bar is a bit out of the city limits. I remember that I was just cleaning a glass, when I turn around, and I kind of do a double take. He looked familiar, but I couldn't think of where. He comes up, basically running to the bar screaming my name, and after a few seconds did it hit me. Instead of being overcome with joy as he expected me to be, I was instantly paralyzed to the spot. How the hell did he locate me, I thought. I was very careful about giving out information, and never told anyone specifically where I worked. When I asked him how he found me, after recovering from the initial shock, he said that he was just, and I quote, passing through the area and needed a drink. I asked him, you do know it's illegal to drink and drive, right? And he said, yeah, yeah, no just like a coke or something. I gave him a half smile, unsure if he were lying or not. 
but my gut told me I couldn't trust him. I served him the drink. We chatted for a bit, but there were other patrons that required my attention. So I dismissed myself, and within about 40 minutes of me not being able to say much to him, he was on his way. I didn't play that night. I was feeling very uncomfortable. Or the next night. My friends started getting concerned, and I reached out to a few of my closest and told them what had happened. They were horrified, and told me they didn't even know he'd done that. But come to think of it, he had asked questions about me. And that's when we started piecing it together. Very quickly, he was kicked out of the friendship group, because we were all very weirded out by his creepy behaviour. I wish it ended there though. He'd pop up at my bar from time to time, come in, and try and talk to me as often as possible. He didn't even care that he was out the group. He was fixated on getting my attention. It got more and more. He began coming in twice a week, then three times, then every day. His stays would last several hours in his attempts to woo me. He would bring me flowers and chocolates, and then that moved on to other creepy things. He started saying that we were in a relationship and that he couldn't wait to move in with me. This was insane. One day, I just went up to my manager and told him I quit and didn't come back in after that. You see, our bar is very small, and only two of us work there in one go. So, it's safe to say that they couldn't just put me at the back or swap my shifts around, because they'd overlap anyway. I was happy to be gone and rid of him, and after a few weeks did I find a new job elsewhere, but it didn't take him long after that to find out where it was. I didn't know how he was getting this information, and I was starting to get really paranoid. I ended up quitting League of Legends because I couldn't hack it. I was sure that someone was telling him what I was doing and where I was going, and I couldn't trust anyone. I ended up moving back to my parents' house and lied low for a little bit, and from there he didn't seem to find me. I hope to not see him again. It's been about three months and I just don't understand why he would fixate on me. I really just want to be left alone. So I work at a McDonald's in the UK area and my McDonald's isn't the best. There's a lot of drugs, alcoholics, and just overall idiots who cause trouble. I'm usually pretty good at fending for myself and shaking things off, but this encounter really freaked me out. So it was a couple of weeks ago, and I was working on the drive through window where you collect your food. It's not uncommon for guys to make sexual comments or innuendos when they come to the drive through because they really don't have to face any consequences. However, this one guy came through the drive through and commented on my beautiful BJ lips and asked me to meet him out back to put them to good use. I declined in the politest way I possibly could manage, and I told him to move along as he was holding up the queue of cars. He moved, and I thought that was the end of the whole ordeal. Five minutes later, the same dude comes around again and makes even more sexual comments about me, my hair, all the creepy things he'd like to do to me. They were quite disturbing and very disgusting. They were mostly about the things he'd do to me which seemed more like torture methods than sexual acts. I was shocked and quite visibly sickened, so he drove off and I told my manager that I felt uncomfortable by this customer and asked to be moved to a different station in case he'd come back around. Apparently he did because the boy who switched stations with me also had an encounter with this guy. He asked where I was, what my name is, if this guy would give him my phone number if he knew where I lived and what time I finished. The boy, thankfully, only told him my name and that I had been moved into the front counter before he realized the guy was a total freak and decided not to say anything more. 
This is where the story gets really weird for me. The creepy guy came into the store and came up to the till I was stationed on. He made similar remarks about what he wanted to do to me if he were to ever get his hands on me. He didn't stop until other customers interrupted him and told him to back off and walk away because I was getting really upset and shaken. He wouldn't leave, so I tried to walk away, which is when this guy tried to jump over the counter and get to my side of the store. Luckily, my managers and a few other staff members grabbed a hold of him and stopped him from getting near to me. But that didn't stop him from fighting back and still trying to touch me and get near me. At one point, he was clawing at my co-workers with his long, nasty nails. Other members of the staff alerted the staff safe, a sort of panic button that connects us right to the police. Fortunately, because I work in a rough area, police patrol very closely to where I work, so they managed to get there pretty quickly. They detained the guy and found a few knives stashed all over his body. Army knives, pocket knives, and even just small regular kitchen knives. As they were dragging him away, he continued to scream about how he was going to wait outside the store for me every day, and that we belonged together, and just screaming all the rantings of a madman. My manager sent me home in a taxi, and I've never seen this guy, his car, or anything else of his again, which I thank my stars for. So, creepy McDonald's drive through dude who must have been on some sort of drug? Let's never meet again. I had two stalkers. One tracked down where I worked from a discussion we had on IRC and showed up at my work and browsed the store for an hour before coming up to the counter and asking me a bunch of nonsensical questions. He finally asked me if I knew who he was and said I had no idea. And he said he was a paranoid android from IRC and asked if I wanted to get a coffee after work. I politely declined and he left but showed up again for the next day and just stood around and talked to me while I worked. He continued doing this for weeks, just showing up and talking to me, while I basically ignored him, and I finally had to say that I had a boyfriend and that he couldn't come in anymore. I didn't want to lie, but it just creeped me out so much. He showed up again a month or so later and asked if I still had a boyfriend and I told him we got engaged and were moving far, far away. The second stalking was online only, thankfully. It started in the MySpace days and continues to this day. He finds me everywhere I go. I don't have a Facebook account in my real name because of this guy. He doesn't know about this Reddit account, thankfully. It's the only place I can post without worrying. Obsession is a weird thing. I'm a 28 year old female living in Scotland. This is an updated repost. I have a disturbing odd story that I've never considered sharing until now. My cousin and I are the same age and we're 14 at the beginning of this ordeal. My cousin had gotten a new computer and it installed MSN. She added a lot of random people. She started talking to one boy often. He claimed his name was Mark Halligan, age 15 from Blackpool, England. They started talking every day, exchanging innocent pictures and becoming close friends. He soon admitted that he was older, 16, and apologized for lying. My cousin gave him the benefit of the doubt and continued talking to him. He knew it was her birthday soon and wanted to send her a gift to the house. She told me this and that we wanted to see what he would send. So she agreed. He sent her a lot of stuff. A DVD player, a huge teddy bear, DVDs, CDs, clothes, and sweets. To cover it up, she explained to her parents that it was a prize from a school competition. Sending gifts became a regular thing. He told her that he made the money from an under 21 year old football placement. Well, a few months passed and he wanted to come up to meet. 
She agreed. But of course, the day before he was due to come up, he confessed that he was 21, had a car and a job. She was now 15 and thought it was appealing to be with an older guy and still went through with the meet. I phoned her that night and she didn't tell me much, only that she didn't want to talk to him again and didn't say much else about it. A few days later, I received a friend request from Mark. I accepted and he told me that she had stopped talking to him and he wanted to know why. I didn't have answers other than she just didn't want to speak to him again. We started to become good friends and we were talking daily and I found him really funny and easy to talk to. I told my cousin that we had been speaking and she asked me not to speak to him again but didn't tell me why. No explanation at all. That night I told Mark what my cousin had said and he asked to call me to sort things out. I agreed and later that night he called. The voice on the other end of the phone was male but squeaky. We spoke and he explained that he had an accident when he was younger and that's why he sounded that way. I felt bad and just kept talking to him, assuming that that's why my cousin got spooked. A few days later I got a call from my cousin who told me that a large package had arrived at her house for me. I went to her house and we both opened it. It was band t-shirts, CDs, Converse, books, an iPod and money. I was happy being spoiled. You see it in movies. Women being showered with gifts and attention. I called Mark to thank him for the gifts. He was happy that I was happy and we kept talking for a few hours. Lo and behold, he asked me to come up to visit. I agreed. I told my best friend and she was very wary and insisted on going with me. The day of the meet, we agreed on the location at 10 minutes from my house. We waited at the location and he was 10 minutes late which magnified the nerves. A blue Volkswagen Golf belted towards us and slammed on the brakes. At this point we both knew something was seriously wrong. He sat for five minutes before getting out. What got out of the car was terrifying. We were expecting someone who was 21, handsome, and tall. He stepped out of that car, was around five foot tall. He was all in denim and his face looked like it was all covered in burn scars. The man was easily in his 50s or 60s, which was truly intimidating. We smiled, said hello, and asked him to go on a walk. And while walking, my friend and I whispered and planned to get away. We told him that we were going to pop into my friend's house, which was en route to back to my house, to get a DVD to watch at my place. Both of us hiding tears went to the door, leaving him on the street. We could have collapsed at the door. We quickly told him what was happening and that we needed to get away. He told us to lock the door and we went out the back door, climbed the fence and ran like the wind between houses and back gardens to heavily wooded area that led to my house. We stayed there for hours. We knew roughly how long it would take him to get back to his car and maybe drive around and look for us. So we had to keep away from the roads and if we stayed put, we would be safe. During this time, we had calls from Mark coming through but let them ring out. We ran to my house and I called my cousin to ask her basically what the fuck. Her dad dropped her off and we talked it out. The four of us stayed at mine all night and didn't leave each other alone for a few days. We both got texts and phone calls after this meet, but we basically just ignored them until they stopped. We were too scared to tell anyone so we decided to keep it all a secret. Cut to about six months later, my friend and I were going to Blackpool for a long weekend with her parents. About two days into the trip, I got a text saying that he saw me in Blackpool and confirmed this by describing a mint green summer top that I was wearing and told me that he knew where we were staying. I told him to keep away or I'd phone the police. He apologized and agreed. The next day, I was approached by the lady that ran the bed and breakfast, and she told me that I had an envelope. 
He had written a note that basically said not to phone the police and he would never call me again and included 500 pounds for my friend and I. And being stupid and not thinking, we took the money, already spending it in our heads and never said a word. We didn't hear from him for about a year and then he resurfaced by sending me a picture of him lying with his wrist cut. He texted me after that, telling me that my cousin and I had ruined his life because neither of us loved him. I contacted her and told her about the message. I went around to her house, and we both decided to tell her dad, and he immediately contacted the police and went through us. They asked us to monitor any other contact and report it for evidence. Within hours of sending the picture, Mark had done something absolutely terrifying. He had called my cousin, and her dad insisted on listening in. He told her that he had bought her a car, and it was outside her house, and he had left the area after dropping it off, and gave her a specific description of it. He told her that there was a car key on the wheel, blue bow on the steering wheel, and all the documents for the car were in the back driver's seat. My uncle phoned the police again, and told them about the car, and that he went out to confirm Mark's description of the car. When the police arrived, they arranged for the car to be towed and to trace the numbers and online profiles that he had used. The only information that we got back from the police since that day was that the car was registered to a Pamela Halligan. A person he had told us in previous conversation was his sister, which was confusing because he had told us that his sister had died tragically during an IRA bombing in 1979 at age 10. It was horrible to know that he was watching us when we didn't know, was at my cousin's house when we didn't know. He could have been anywhere at any time, knew anything about us, and had the capability to go to extremes. I've researched his name a million times, different spellings, never found anything. I know his mom and dad owned a hotel in Blackpool, but that's about it. We still get chills talking about him, and have often not been able to finish a full conversation about him due to the horrible realization of what he and we have done. I remember my high school years. I was very exposed and into dating a lot of guys. I'm now 20, and even though it's been a little over five years, call me whatever you want, I don't care, I'm in a happy relationship. In my last year of high school, there was this app going around about asking you questions to another person in their inbox anonymously. And throughout those days of the app, I would keep getting anonymous messages saying, Oh, you're beautiful. I wish I were with you. I wish you were mine. This was summer break of 2017. Like I said, I was exposed to a lot of guys while the app was a hit. I was dating a guy named Ernie. He was very oblivious about the app, and I started flirting with the guy that had been messaging me anonymously, Chad. Chad suddenly slid into my DMs. I started talking from there, and he confessed that it was him who had messaged me all those things. He was cool. He showed me his SoundCloud music, in which I told him they were lame to begin with. I'm a straightforward person, and I guess he liked that. A month went by and we were talking, and I thought it was just as friends, until he told me that he had feelings for me. Now in my town, everyone knows everyone, whether it's through friends, or social media, or school. So I kind of knew who he was in a way, but had just never really met him in person. But anywho, I told him that I was single, even though I was still with someone, and started talking to him. Two weeks go by, and I told Ernie that it was over, because I thought I had feelings for Chad, and I had told Chad that I was into him. A couple of weeks go by from then, and I was dating Chad. But while still speaking to Ernie, one thing led to another, 
and we ended up hooking up. This made me feel guilty. But being the straightforward person I was, I just let Chad know what had happened, and I did feel bad. He told me what a lot of guys would say. I still love you, it doesn't matter anymore. I still couldn't live with myself. The idea that I had kind of cheated on him, and told him there was no way I was going back to him when I hooked up with Ernie. As in doing so, it made me realize I still had feelings for Ernie, and not Chad. This is where he starts to harass me. He was very persistent that he forgave me, and that nothing would change the way he saw me, and I kept saying that I didn't want to be with him. Bear in mind that the time frame of our communication from when I started flirting to when I ended it was about two to three months. I had to block him on everything I had, Snapchat, Instagram, my personal mobile number, as I thought I'd made it clear I didn't want to have anything to do with him. He would then start making accounts and request me. In the pictures he uploaded, he would write paragraphs about how much he missed me, and that would just creep me the hell out and caused me to block him immediately. He created 12 other accounts and messaged me. They are all from him, telling me how much he missed me, how he was crying and hadn't slept in days. I ignored everything until he started contacting my brother and sister. They showed my dad, who in turn got super pissed at me for causing such a mess. I told him that he'll get over it, and that all Chad needed was time. But I was wrong. For the next year and a half, he would create accounts, download apps, and have a temporary number and call me through it. I knew it was him, and never answered. That is until he threatened me. He told me that if I didn't talk to him, he would expose my nudes. Now I worked as a receptionist, and had just started having panic attacks, and I began crying and couldn't stop shaking and I needed to be sent home for the day after that. He did stop for about a month or so, and then went back to it, but this time he would call me with a blocked number. I answered not knowing who it was, because a month or more went by from not knowing about him. And it was Chad. I started going off at him until he began crying. I told him I was going to get a restraining order, and then he said he just wanted to be friends. I thought it would be cool, because I was already going out with someone which is my current boyfriend. So, I accepted that we could be friends, until he started calling me names, and started questioning me on why I left him. I also needed a better excuse to leave him, and I told him, you're crazy and need help, and blocked him immediately. I live in the city of Montbello, and work in Tustin, and have the morning shift from 5am to 2pm. Every day when I go out to my car to get to work, I see a person from the corner of my street with a black hoodie, always staring in my direction. At first, it was like, whatever, because I live in a ghetto neighbourhood, and see sketchy things all the time. Then, one day, I told my neighbour to come out with me to my car, as he's a tall, buff guy. When I see the hooded guy in the corner, I yell out to him, Chad, I'm getting that restraining order on you, and he ran off never to be seen again. A week passed with no sign of him, until one day I get a call from the blocked number, and obviously I decline it. Ever since I declined the block number, I get at least 30 to 50 calls from him every day. I am unable to get the restraining order since I have a very busy schedule. He leaves voicemails, some of him singing, some of him cursing me out, and some of him crying and saying how I was his first girlfriend. On March 13th, 2019, he called me 30 to 50 times a day. I know some will say switch your phone number, but I can't either way. I have two times, and he still manages to find me. I don't wish this upon anyone. I just want to be at ease.
This happened to me recently and I'm still confused and a bit shook about this encounter. In order for you to get a better visual, I'm going to give you some background info. I'm currently finishing my second semester as a sophomore at a community college and since I have three siblings at home, I tend to stay till closing hours, if not after, till the security guard tosses me out to finish my work or study. I usually spend my time at the rotunda, which, for those who don't know what that is, is a round room with two levels. The desks in this area all face the glass outer circle, and if you look up from your work, you can see the other space that has three ways to leave or enter the area. Also, it's important to note that since I technically stay after hours, I have come to know where and when the cleaners start and the usual schedules of the security guards, since I make it my business to avoid them as much as possible. Okay, on to the story. It was about 10 p.m. and I was working on my humanities essay in the rotunda. It was just me and a few remaining students at the area. The college officially closes at 11, so I was fully emerged and typing away as the remaining time slipped away. After a solid 30 to 45 minutes of writing, I took a break to change the music that I was listening to, and I looked up to find the rotunda abandoned all but one person. This was no big deal since I was used to being the only person left at the one time or another. I looked back to my phone and found a song that I was looking for, and I put my phone back down. I glanced up again and found that one person directly across from me was staring at me. Our eyes met, and I quickly looked down, dismissing it as that awkward, oops, I saw you looking at me moment. A few minutes of typing passed, and I couldn't help looking back up to see the other person, and to my surprise, the guy was still staring at me. He didn't have anything on his table, and I couldn't see a backpack from my angle. He was just sitting there, his hands collapsed and covering his mouth as his head was resting on them. This time, I held the glance longer, being a bit annoyed that the guy wasn't turning away. Eventually, I looked back down as the uncomfortable stare continued. A few more minutes passed, and I knew he was still staring. Annoyed, I grabbed my phone and walked off to the bathroom to hide from the guy and text my boyfriend about the weird situation. I know you all must be asking, well, why did you just leave your stuff? Well, the bathroom is right next to the rotunda, and it's not unusual for me or other students to just dip to the bathroom and just be back. Because I didn't want to pack up all my stuff just to unpack it in a few more minutes. Although I didn't think anything would get stolen since there are cameras all around. So I finished my business and turned the corner to return to my table when I see him there. He's just standing at my desk, not touching anything, just staring at my open laptop, or perhaps my notebook. I'm not really sure. In that moment, I thought he was about to steal something, so I sped up and began to approach him, calling out, Hey, can I help you with something? He turned to look at me, and it was the first good look I got at him since he was so close. He seemed to be older than me. I'm guessing upper 20s, perhaps 26. He had messy curly hair, a studdly beard, and just these huge, weirdly bulging dark eyes. Like, imagine pug eyes, but on a man. He didn't say anything, he just stared at me with a blank expression, and then turned around and walked back to his seat. Confused and slightly freaked out, I decided to call my boyfriend and told him about the encounter. He suggested moving to another spot, and I agreed, constantly having him on the phone to show the guy I technically was not alone. I just packed up my stuff and headed down the hallway exit from the rotunda. Being a little paranoid, I turned around to check if he was following me. I didn't see him. I ended my call after assuring my boyfriend that I was fine. I forgot to mention that the campus has some buildings that are connected. The rotunda is in the D building, and that connects to the next building, which was where I was headed to. 
It was past 11 now, and the school was officially closed. When it reaches 11, the door shuts and you can't get in from the outside, or open some doors from the inside, but it's no big deal as long as you know the path that you need to take. I make it to the next study area, and I put my bag down to unpack. I finished my essay rather quick, and I forgot about the weird guy. It's about 11.30 when I hide my laptop and pull out my math homework. I only had a little bit left, so I wanted to crank it out before I headed home. Digging through my bag, I realized that I forgot my math textbook in the car, and with a sigh, I got up to go get it. I had parked at the parking garage, which luckily was connected to the next building over, so I wouldn't need to go outside. I leave my stuff, grab my keys, and headed down to the hall into the next building. It's a straight hallway all the way down to the next building, so when you turn backwards, you can see the buildings past the study room behind you. I stop by the water fountain, and from the corner of my eye, I see him. It's the same guy. It's the same guy, and he's standing at the entrance of the hallway behind me. I quickly turn around and begin to speed walk forward. I kept telling myself that it's okay, that he's probably just heading to his car. I finally take the turn right after the hallway ends and I enter the next building. I rush up the stairs and take another corridor that leads to the parking garage. I glance over my shoulder and there he is, closer. Too close. He had to have run in order to catch up to me. I'm sure of it. I walk into the parking garage and run into my car. It's parked close, so I fling open the back seat and jump in. I don't know what I was thinking and why I wouldn't jump in the driver's seat. I just wanted to hide. It came to me that when I left all my stuff back in the study room, and I gave myself a mental slap in the face as I peeked out over my window. He was standing by the entrance. He wasn't looking around or walking towards me or any car. He was just blankly staring into the parking lot. At this point I became angry. I don't know what came over me, but I was so over this encounter. Mumbling under my breath, I grabbed the textbook off the seat, opened my door and stepped out. My car door gave out an echo as I slammed it shut. I saw his glance fall over me. With my mind made up, I headed towards him and the entrance. At first, I was ready to mouth him off, but with every step closer, that sure of courage I had began to dwindle away. I walked right past him, not saying a word, and he just stared. He didn't say anything. Those huge eyes just followed me around him. The moment the door closed behind me, I bolted. I ran faster than I ever have back down the corridor, through the hallway, and back into the study room where I threw everything into my backpack and then flung the backpack on my back. I turned to head back down through the hallway and there he was again, just standing and just looking. He finally opened his mouth and said hello. I was so utterly confused. We were alone. It was probably about 12 at night now. The cleaners were just starting to clean the A building and I knew security was somewhere around the J building. So if the guy pulled anything, no one would be able to help me. Carefully I took a step forward, ready to go around him while responding with a weak smile. He just stared and stood still for a bit, seemingly wanting to say something. I looked down and I made my move to go around him, but he blocked my way. I looked up and said, excuse me, can I get through? He didn't move. Internally freaking out, I tried to nudge past him again, but he continued to block my path. Finally, I said, hey man, what's your problem? He just kept looking at me, not blinking. What's your name? He finally asked. I gave him a fake one and tried to walk past him again. He blocked me again. What's your name? He asked again. I just told you, I snapped. 
What's your real name? He asked, taking a step forward. Screw you, I replied. My fear was over. I had gotten fed up with the anxiety and paranoia this guy had caused me. All I wanted to do was be left alone. This guy's face turned angry, and he suddenly reached out to grab me. He missed as I dodged sideways and yelled, What the fuck, dude? He lunged again, and I dodged and then turned around to run into the other building. My heart was pounding as I mentally created a plan to ditch this guy. I was freaking out. I hadn't expected him to react in such a way. I ran through the D building trying to remember how to get to the A without running into the locked doors. I had to run into the cleaners to at least have the other people face the guy with me. They were closer than the police, at least to my knowledge. During the run, he was right behind me, calling my real name, saying that I must wait for him, that I wasn't being ladylike. He was fast, and I could hear his stomps behind me. I knew it wouldn't make it to the A building in time. He would surely catch me before then. I had to lose him somehow. I was running past the rotunda almost in tears when I remembered about the locked doors. After the exit from the rotunda, there was a staircase leading down and then two possible routes. Turning left would bring me to a lecture hall that had doors that didn't lock, but the exit to the outside was locked once the door slammed shut. Turning right would lead me down under the rotunda and then towards the other building but using the lower levels. I flew down the stairs as I turned left and realized the man had slowed down. He was jogging now behind me, but he was laughing. I dove into the lecture room and headed for the exit. I swung the door open and then turned around and ran up the levels of the lecture hall and hid behind one of the desks. The exit door is heavy and slowly closes as I heard the lecture entrance door open. I could still hear the exit door sliding shut. I heard the guy ran past and then the exit door creaked open again and then slowly shut, the click echoing as it finally closed. I sat silent for a few minutes until I finally peeked past the desk. There was no one there. He had run outside, probably thinking I bolted for it. It was there where I finally took a minute to breathe. My hands were shaking as I took out my phone to call the college police. I explained what happened and told them that I would wait in the lecture room until they arrived. I walked down the levels and when I reached the ground level, I looked out the exit door and my blood ran cold. He was there. His eyes widened when he saw me and he tried the door handle but it obviously did nothing since it was locked. He kicked the door in anger, gave me one final look and then walked off into the darkness. I stayed in that room shaking and jumping at every little sound until the police arrived. I was scolded for staying out after hours, and the police took down my ID number, but when they listened to what happened to me I think they took pity. One of the officers left to go to patrol the area, while the other one escorted me to my car. This was a little bit more than a week ago, and I have not been given any more updates on whether they caught the guy. I'm still thinking about everything that happened. How did he know my name? Did he see it on my essay when he was staring at my laptop? Why had he followed me to the car and not tried to attack me there when we were all alone? If, if that was his plan all along. Was he a student? And if so, why didn't he have anything with him? However, whoever that guy was, let's not meet again. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. If you did, don't forget to drop a like and leave a comment with your thoughts as it goes a long way. Also, huge thank you to Celestial Noir for featuring in tonight's video. If you enjoyed his narrations, which I'm sure you did, feel free to check out part two of this collaboration over on his channel, where you can listen to even more stalker stories. So, without further ado, 
I'm going to end the video there. The link over to Celestial Nor's video is in the description and will be showing now. I'll see you in the next one.